morning, everyone, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming such a from such far distances in some cases, some closer. Um, just to um, introduce myself, um, my name is Jeff, um, and I'm an archaeologist by training, uh, although I began as an anthropologist, but I've developed an interest in history. Um, and my speciality is actually rock paintings. I work with Psalm Rock Art, particularly in the northeastern Cape area, uh, run by Makia Yugi uh, Toro. Um, and it's through my work there that I first encountered the name of Hans Lachenberg and how I became uh, interested in this. And I did my PhD many, many years ago and then uh, at, uh, in Sweden, and then I was working in Witz. And then about a year ago, I moved to the Cosmo and Tal Museum. And uh, a couple of months ago, I got a strange call from this guy called Croy Mayers, who starts telling me that he's related to Hans Lochenberg and uh, to Nicholas Lochenberg. And we started having discussions. And uh, I, must, I must confess, I was a bit skeptical when you first phoned. I had to check you out on, the, on Google. Because <laughs> um, when, you, when you, you sort of sit in these isolated halls of academia reading this stuff, it's a little bit. Uh, kind of divorced from the reality of the current situation in South Africa for, for historians. Um, so it's, it's a, it was really a stun to hear that the, the Lochenbergs are thriving, uh, the Biggers, the Duns, uh, all of these people and others, the Koch family are all still around um, and, and uh, involved in issues in contemporary South Africa. So what I'm going to present to you today uh, is the, the work of the last couple of months, um, and that work has really been done uh, not by myself alone, but by myself, Troy in particular, we've had lots of discussions with, and also Angela Ferreira, who's a, a history student from Pitt University. And um, it's very much a work in progress. So what you're going to see is not the final uh, thing that we've done, um, but we're going to show you a lot of the results. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about the Lochenbergs only. I know there's a whole lot of you from different backgrounds, and uh, some of you might have requested a really help to your family history. And all I can tell you is that we can help as far as possible, but this work takes uh, an enormous amount of time and also a lot of resources because the material is scattered in archives all over the country, and in some cases in other parts of the world, and those we haven't been able to access yet. So there are some, some caveats to what I'm going to present today, um, just to, to, to be clear as to you know, what, what it is I'm going to tell you about. So the, the research that we focused on has uh, been specifically on two members of the Lochenberg family, and that is uh, Nicholas Lochenberg and Hans Lochenberg. Uh, and it's because really the, the story, as we are interested in it, starts with Nicholas uh, Lochenberg in the early 1800s, late 1700s in the Cape Colony. And then his eldest son Hans uh, picks up that story. And these are the two characters that we focused on because they're also the characters that appear in the archival and historical literature uh, the most. Um, it's not to say that there aren't other people. Uh, Hans has a brother called Willem. There's some information on him. We might mention him a little bit. And he had uh, three sisters, uh, of which there's not very much information. Um, so that's the, the, the first caveat. Okay. Um, the second point is that what I've included here, as far as possible, is material from what we call the primary sources. So rather than reading it in a book, many of you might have read. Um, Hazel Crampton's book, The Sunburned Queen, which has some mention of, of uh, Nicholas Lochenberg and Hans Lochenberg. Um, where she's mentioned things like that, we've tried to go back to the original sources and check on those sources to see whether she got it right or uh, you know, can we verify this sort of thing. And uh, this is a standard practice because we all get things wrong. And even in the archive, people get things wrong. Okay, so there are uh, Wesleyan missionaries, for example, that might report on something and they get the dates wrong uh, sometimes. And we know they get the dates wrong because there are other sources to show that the dates are, are different. So we focused mostly on that. Okay, we have not focused on the genealogical material. Okay, and I'll explain that to you right at the end, uh, which is a place we sort of want to go. But the reason for that is, is the minute that you start, Mr. Stand up. Speak up, Speak up. sorry, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, we, we haven't focused on the genealogical records because they, uh, first of all, it's very difficult to get to the, the different records as they're scattered. Um, it means driving around. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. I know some of you have seen that stuff. But I can't verify that stuff uh, necessarily. So we, we've tried to avoid that. There's a look, one or two bits in here because they provide context. 
Um, but I haven't focused on that. And it's also, it becomes a, a bit of a nightmare to follow because you might have uh, one person who has 10 children and then that one of those 10 children has another six children and so on. Okay? And it becomes a spider web. And you will, in fact, know way more about that than any historian can tell you. You connect it with each other and you know your, your genealogies quite well. Um, and so then the other thing is we have not considered the relationship in what I'm going to present to you right now of the Lochenberg family to other so-called frontier families, the Duns, the Biggers, etc. Right? And I, you all know some of that as well. Okay? With the exception of the Finn family briefly. Right? And I'll explain that to you in the talk where we arrive at that point because it's quite an interesting uh, relationship. Right, now the, the only other thing is I've got 45 minutes. I'm not sure I'm going to make it. There are about 45 slides, and uh, a lot of it is in text form. Right? It's probably to help me try and remember where I am, um, but also to show you that this material is coming from the archive. It's not just being made up. Okay, so we're going to talk in the first bit of the talk about Nicholas Lachenberg because he's the first sort of person that we are actually interested in. And um, he is not the first Lochenberg to come to South Africa, obviously, okay? Uh, there's a guy called Jan van Lochenberg who comes from Rotterdam in about 1717 uh, in the Dutch East India Company, all right? And if you're interested, I can certainly distribute some of the, the literature to you. Uh, there's an article by a man called Basil Holt um, who's published, uh, as far as you can see, he's the only person who was interested in Nicholas Lochenberg as a character. Uh, what we find in the historical material and to some degree in the archive is that Nicholas and, and Hans as well uh, play parts in other people's stories. Uh, you might find there's mention of Hans in Henry Francis Finn's story um, and he, may, he pops up there and there. And it's a bit frustrating because we don't have the full story of, of Nicholas or Hans. Uh, they never really got a chance to write their own stories. Um, on the other hand, it's fascinating because they link uh, history in the southeastern part of South Africa uh, in, in a kind of a thread that very few other people had. Uh, you might be reading something like Thomas Baines in the 1850s uh, or a missionary report from the 1820s and the same name of Lochenberg crops up and you realize that the Lochenbergs basically met every other famous player in the southeastern seaboard during the 19th century. So they link history in a way that very few other individuals do in this country. Okay, so um, the, obviously the original name was Van Lachenberg, not Van Lachenberg, that's been changed. And you will see that, you see that in the, the historical material, it's misspelled, mistreated, it's changed differently. So you've got to just be a bit aware when you're reading this stuff. In some cases it's called Hachenberg, okay, not, uh, not Lachenberg. Uh, the English will spell it Lachenberg, um, with an L-A-C-H sometimes, so it, it gets a little bit out of hand. But anyway, um, Jan van Lachenberg uh, gets married um, in South Africa in 1724, and he has a number of kids. Um, and the eldest of that, as far as I know, is a guy called Johannes, and he becomes a burger at Stellenbosch, okay, around about 1725, according to Basil Holt. Um, and then Johannes marries uh, a fantastic the named Dutch lady of Getrage Abigail Wecher um, in 1767, and they have eight children, okay, including Nicholas, okay, or Nicholas, actually, as it is in Dutch. And he's often referred to as class in the literature as an abbreviation, okay. And it's later that he shortens his surname. So he's born at Van Lachenberg and he becomes Lachenberg, okay, or Lachenberg. Um, and uh, we don't quite know the birth date, but we've got the date that he was baptized, which is the 1st of February of 1767. So we assume pretty close uh, to that. And then he becomes a citizen of Graf Renet. Okay? And that would have been in the latter part of the 1700s. Graf Renet uh, is founded quite late in colonial history. Um, and we're not entirely sure uh, what happens uh, to Nicholas and Crawford, but uh, from about the, the 17, mid 1790s, there's a string of rebellions that happen in Crawford Net. And uh, many of the Dutch citizens leave. The British had just arrived for the first occupation um, of Southern Africa, and many of the, the Dutch citizens leave uh, the colony and go and live with other people. And Nicholas is one of these uh, people. But prior to this, he's actually married okay, to an Alberta Maria Jobet. Right, uh, a Dutch lady, and he has children with her. Okay, um, 
And then in the 1790s, as I pointed out, uh, we, we know that he absconds, okay? Because you're technically not allowed to leave the colony as a citizen, all right? They don't want you going across the border because they're living in a kind of a lager world where Europe is uh, being rebuilt around the Cape, okay? So they don't really want you to leave, all right? But he leaves with his brother and other rebels who are attached to a man called Kunrad de Base, who's quite a famous uh, person in Southern Africa. Some has been written about him. Um, and they then also attach themselves uh, to a mission called Thunder Camp. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about him. Okay? So they leave the colony. Okay? Nicholas leaves the colony. And it's a bit unclear exactly what route he takes to, to end up where he is. Um, but we know certainly that he was in the craft permit area and that he leaves from there. Okay? Um, then he sort of disappears a little bit, um, and all of this, what, the way that we know that is this is Nicholas telling missionaries or uh, missionaries or other people meeting him and, and having brief discussions and then mentioning them in their diaries. Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned that Nicholas gets involved with a, a missionary called Thunder Kemp, he's one of the first missionaries in the country, and uh, Thunder Kemp meets um, a Khoisan woman called Sara. We don't know what her second name is. Sara would not have been an indigenous name either. Um, but he develops a close relationship with Sara. And he begins to instruct her uh, in the Bible, being a missionary who wants to convert everyone to Christianity. And uh, he also teaches her the rudimentary skills of, of reading and, as far as we can tell, a little bit of writing. Uh, but it's never, her education is never quite finished because she has to leave. Um, and it's unclear why she has to leave from the camp. The word jealousy keeps coming up. We're not sure who's jealous of whom, whether it's the local community that are jealous of her or um, some other issue. All right. And anyway, all of these characters end up in uh, around about Hensa's Kral uh, in uh, what, we, what we call today the Trans Sky. Okay. Sorry, something else I should just mention is that Sarah was also baptized. Okay, she was baptized into the Christian faith, faith by um, from the camp. Okay, um, so they all end up, Sarah, uh, Nicholas, and a couple of other people end up around about Hintz's uh, crawl in uh, um, Sky. Something that I should also point out, we're going to, you're going to see some words that uh, or offensive, um, uh, and these are words that come out of the archive. I've just left them in as they are. Uh, these words weren't always offensive, they become more offensive as time progresses. So I hope nobody's going to take offense, but it's just this is actually what is in the archive that I've given you, tried to give to you verbatim. Okay? Um, so the, the next thing that we, we learn about Nicholas is in a trip made by a man called Colonel Collins around about 1809. Now the British have got control of the Cape. And Collins makes a journey out to the eastern frontier and he arrives close to Hintz's Kral and he meets Nicholas van Lockenberg. Okay? And he describes that Nicholas is living uh, with a group of people uh, that he calls Hottentots. Um, but they, they're kind of mixed, there's also some closer guys there and they're living uh, under the auspices of Chief Hintz, who's the paramount closer chief at this point, okay? the closest guy basically to the edge of the, the colony. And um, he describes uh, Nicholas as being in charge of this community. Right? And Nicholas also has connections to Hinsa, right? in the sense that he has the, the ear of the, the paranormal chief. And he tells us that Hinsa is married to a Khoisan woman called Sarah. Okay? So, and that they have a number of kids together. Now, Collins offers Van Lochenberg a reprieve, okay? And there's another Englishman there as well where he offers a reprieve to. Basically, the reprieve is you can come back to the colony and no action will be taken against you, all right? Um, but in Collins' journal, he describes this, the, the fact that Nicholas is scared. So Nicholas doesn't want to meet him because he thinks he's going to be arrested and taken back for, for trial in the colony. And in those days, they were absolutely brutal in the way that they treated people, all right? It was kind of on the rack and torture before they executed you. So nobody in their right mind would want to go back to, to the colony. Um, so understandably, he tries to avoid Collins. So the, the reprieve is offered, and it's not clear whether Nicholas actually takes it up. All right? And that's an interesting point, because 
there are records in, in, in the Cape that other people have found and written about that talk about Nicholas's children with his first wife now, uh, the Dutch lady, uh, and, and talking about their births and their, their baptizing and so on. Right? And it's not clear what Nicholas's relationship is at this point to everyone. Right? Is he having two families, one in the colony and one outside of the colony? Because he has five children with Sarah over many years. Okay? And um, it's also not clear whether he is has one foot in the colony and one foot out of the colony. Okay? And this is very interesting because if he is, it means he's, he's working the system to great benefit. Okay? It means he's a very shrewd actor in the, in the historical system. And um, uh, it, it would seem the way that people write about him and what we found, or the little bits they write about him in that record, that he's actually left the colony and he, these other children of his are no longer under his sort of um, tutelage or uh, is kind of an absent father, for, for want of a better word. Um, but there is evidence to suggest that Nicholas still owned farms in the colony. And it's not clear whether he's working them or whether he's left these farms to his children with the treasure okay, um, in, in uh, uh, the colony. And this is an area that is absolutely really interesting and we'd like to try and investigate a little bit further. Okay. Um, then we've now sort of moved from the 20 years in a very short space of time. Um, the, the next we sort of hear of, uh, of Nicholas is in uh, correspondence from the Reverend John Philip, another very famous missionary. Okay. And uh, at this point, Philip in 1819 is looking to set up a new mission station. Uh, and this mission station would eventually become the very famous Cap River Mission Station. But before that, he's looking to put it on a farm somewhere, uh, because it's a Bethel store at this point, and people are starting. And uh, he sends out his other sort of missionaries to go and find place, places for him. And one of the places they look at is a farm owned by Nicholas from Lockenburg. So he's clearly still owning property in the colony at this point. Um, anyway, the dealings fall through because Nicholas wants 5,000 pounds for his property, which the missionaries felt was a bit exorbitant today. Okay. So uh, at any rate, if this is Nicholas Lockenburg, he's a very shrewd operator. All right. <laughs> Now, some of this shrewdness is in fact picked up by commentators in the 19th century, by the people who have been meeting and so on. But there, there is unfortunately a, a discourse that comes about when talking about Lochenbergs, not just the Lochenbergs, but anyone who is either not white, uh, but not black either. So if you're not part of the Closer Chieftain, or the Tenbu Chieftain, or the, the, the Ponder Chieftain, uh, but you're kind of a hot and tart to sand somewhere, you all know all this sort of stuff. The word kind of scallon gets used. Okay? Um, there's a, a phrase that's called, uh, it appears in the historical literature quite a lot, scallon, hot and tart, and runaway slaves. Okay? To talk about everybody who doesn't fit into the colony and everybody who's not part of uh, the bigger organized chieftains. Okay? And it is, in fact, um, a discourse of dispossession because those ideas are used to take people's land and identities away from them. Okay. And um, there is another side to this that we've been finding when we read through the literature uh, that, that's a counter-narrative to some of this um, pejorative stuff that comes out of uh, particularly the English uh, colonial accounts. Um, and that is that Lockenberg, Nicholas in particular, um, and then his two sons, Hans and Willem, that we'll talk about, uh, about later, are intimately tied to the world of the missionaries. Okay? And Nicholas is particularly tied through his marriage to Sarah. Sarah becomes a devout Christian, um, and she, in fact, wants to move closer from where they're staying. In the early, 19, uh, early 1800s, they are staying at a place called Mazeppa Bay. And I'll put up a map at the end of August to show you where that is. And she wants to move closer to a mission station called Butterworth, uh, which is very close to its mission station to the closer. Uh, close to Hence's uh, uh, Paramount settlement. And um, she, she convinces Nicholas to uh, move closer to this area. Okay? And Nicholas's um, sort of connection to these missionaries is, is, is quite extensive. He helps them a lot. Right? 
He is visited uh, certainly in 1827 by two Wesleyan missionaries, Shaw and Shrewsbury. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit too small to see. Okay. But, uh, and they ask him to, to take uh, them to see uh, shipwrecked, European shipwrecked survivors that were thought to be from the Grove. No, they're not. The women, white women that were shipwrecked on a, a vessel prior to the, 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 the sinking of the Grove. And they intermarried into closer society and forming uh, a clan called the Um And uh, so, and uh, Nicholas takes the missionaries there. And the missionaries are very, very impressed with them. Okay? They, it's quite clear in his accounts of the journeys but Nicholas is not just somebody who's stuck in, in a small place. He bridges woods. Right? He moves across the whole of the Eastern Cape. And we'll see that when he comes to his death. He knows the paramount leaders. Uh, they respect him. Uh, they employ him for various tasks. And he knows multiple small groups of people. Okay? This guy got around. Okay? He's a, a real mover and shaker, for, for want of a better part. And um, he's also asked to be part of the laying of the foundation stones for the mission station at Butterworth, the first mission station to the Closet. Right. And uh, uh, Shrewsbury, the man who sort of arranged it, was quite a liberal. Not all missionaries were liberal. Some of them were less liberal than others. But uh, Shrewsbury is quite a liberal man, and he believes in a global culture and a global society. And he wants representatives from multiple communities to help lay the foundation stones. And he has a, a sand guy there, he has a, a so-called hot dot or a quay guy there, he has an Englishman, and he asked Nicholas to represent the Dutch nation at the, the founding of this mission station. Okay. That's good. It's quite an honor. All right? And um, so Nicholas, some people talk about him as this kind of scam, but for the missionaries, he's not. Okay. For the missionaries, he's a highly dependable guy. He, in fact, looks after the mission station at Butterworth in one of the absences of Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury actually asked him, look, I have to go to Cape Town, will you please oversee the mission station and look after it? And he does this. Um, so it's clear they have massive confidence in him, and he's quite a competent and capable guy. And he's capable of meeting and moving around different worlds and interacting with people. Right? Um, so, this, sorry, this is just an account uh, again of uh, the trip to go and meet um, the descendants of the, of the shipwreck survivors. Uh, it's just in Shaw's diary and so on. It's about 1827 to 1828 um, they, they do this trip. So we don't have to worry too much about that. Okay. Um, the one thing I do want to point out here for you is that in 1828, uh, on this, this trip, Shaw, sorry, so there's two missionaries, Shrewsbury, who runs the Butterworth one, and Shaw, who's the head of all the mission stations. Shaw comes out to meet Nicholas as well, and he's also impressed with Nicholas. And together, they all make this journey down to go meet the shipwreck survivors. And on this journey, Shaw describes that Nicholas is a brilliant hunter, right? And that he specializes in shooting hippos right? with his rook, which is one of these big uh, musket-type guns. Now, we're going to see later on some famous hunters struggle to shoot hippos. Okay? Hippos are very difficult to kill with firearms at this point. Um, you have to shoot them in the ear to get to the brain cavity. And you have to kind of overload your gun a little bit. It's quite a complex, subtle art. But Nicholas has perfected this. Okay? And it's one of the things that gives him his uh, maneuverability and power and influence throughout the whole southeast interior of the, the South Africa is his ability with a firearm. Okay? So he's a, he's a hunter as well. And we know that he's hunting ivory and he's. he's shipping that ivory to the colony, okay, making money out of it. A lot of people do that, the Finns as well. Right. Uh, one of the, 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 the important things about the Shaw um, descriptions, and I've got it up there in bold, I don't know if you're going to see it. He describes, and this is perhaps what many of you are interested in, he describes Nicholas as, he is the headman of a kraal and has a number of people under his control. Okay, so you've added that emphasis. Um, because he's recognized as a chief by the missionaries. Right? He's not just uh, this kind of shrewd operator. Right? People are recognize him as a chief. And if you've got the ear of Hensa, you, you're, you're a big deal. Okay? He's not just going to talk to you if you don't know nobody. 
Um, again, this sorry, is more of the, the, the trip in the 18, uh, 1828. Um, again, the last quote here is important because it tells you that Lochenberg knows this country intimately. Right? He moves across this space. Uh, he has horses, he has guns. There's a, a following of people who, who he's also trained to use guns. Okay? And uh, they become this kind of mobile force, although they live in one place. They provide services for various people in return for payment um, and so on. And unfortunately, that is going to lead to his, his demise uh, a year later, in 1829. Okay. Um, again, this is sorry, just more of the trip. Uh, this is one of the few in-depth accounts we have of more than just a fleeting meeting with Nicholas. That's where the missionary spent a couple of days with him and he guided him to the place. So I'll put a lot of that in here for, for you. And you're most welcome, I can give you this platform to anyone who wants it um, at this point. Okay. Um, and the arrow is just the, the slide where we're talking about them talking about how he shoots uh, hippos, which are called sea cows or sea coolies, as you know, um, at this point. Okay. Um, now, last sort of word about um, Nicholas from, from the missionaries, uh, that he was a pleasant and useful companion, um, and they were very much taken with him. Now, in 1829, a year after this uh, uh, trip to, to meet these shipwreck survivors, Nicholas is far east in South Africa. He's away from uh, the Butterworth area, um, around about the Umzumbugu River, okay, uh, in present-day Kronoskaya. He has, in early 1829, also assisted in founding another mission station called Morley that's close to the Umzumbugu River area. Um, that's not what's of interest to us here. What is of interest is, is how Nicholas comes to die. Okay? Um, because uh, it's quite important to understand what happens to his son, Hans, and why Hans comes to do what Hans does later. So, uh, Nicholas Lochenberg in 1829, middle of the year, is up in the Umzumbu River area. And the reason he's there is that the three tributaries, the Umzumbu itself, the Tina and the Tsitsa River, are places where there are a lot of hippos. There are also a lot of elephants there, and it's a big area where people go to hunt. Okay. And in fact, in 1829, while Nicholas is there, uh, the well-known sort of South African traveler, hunter, Andrew Geddes Baines, is also in this area. Andrew Geddes Baines has gone there because he wants to hunt ivory, and he's heard of people, including sand people, who trail ivory. Okay. And so he wants to go get the ivory from, from them. When he is there, he hears of another white man who's in the area, and he's ast astonished at this. He doesn't know who this is, because he thinks he's the first guy to be there. But it's Hans, okay. I mean, sorry, it's Nicholas, who's in the area, hunting. Now, Andrew Gillis Baines was a celebrated uh, hunter, and he tries to shoot um, some of these hippos. And he shoots all day, and he just brings them, and nothing happens, and then she kind of gives up, okay. Uh, the Khoisan guys, they help him, they've got poisoned uh, harpoons, and they, they kill some of them. Now, uh, Geddes, Andrew Geddes Baines has to leave uh, shortly after the, the, these incidents, and he starts to head back towards Grahamstown area where he's from. And um, one of the reasons he has to leave is there's been an invasion of Zulu-speaking people from Natal. They've come into the Eastern Gate area, to the Umzumbu area, and these are guys called the Kwabe, and uh, they are in fact, fact uh, feeling Dingan. Okay, Dingo wants to kill the years and then of Kretel, and they come into. Um, oh, sorry, I'm still speaking too soft. Okay, uh, they've they've come they've come to kind of cause havoc in the Eastern Cape, um, as you guys did in those days, and uh, they, they they've come with an MP, all right, and they attack several of the mission stations and they actually kill some missionaries. They also kill uh, Lieutenant Francis Farewell, one of Finn's compatriots. In, Durban, um, and everybody in the Eastern Cape is scared. Okay, nobody, everybody's scared of the zoo <laughs> today too. So everyone is, is really scared of it, and um, because they, they come with, they're quite tough guys, and they come with large numbers again, okay, small gangs of ten thousand or so. And uh, anyway, so the Pondo, who are the first guys on to take the brunt of this approach Nicholas to help them in the fight against 
Kwame. Okay. Nicholas is, is sort of it's difficult because we don't know what he did. We only have accounts from other people. Andrew Gettys Baines met one of the people that was with Nicholas when this happened. But what appears to be the case is that Nicholas took his group of uh, Kwe sand guys who had firearms, because there wouldn't have been firearms in those days, and he attacked uh, Kabo, uh, the Kabe and he wounded Kreto in the thigh. Right? But he underestimated their numbers and their anger, and they pretty much overwhelmed Nicholas very quickly and killed him and virtually his entire entourage, with the exception of one guy who escaped, which is how the story is known, apparently. And uh, literally, Nicholas is physically ripped apart. Okay? His body is torn to pieces in, in the, the Zulu attack. Um, and th that is the, the kind of end of, of, of Nicholas's rather amazing story um, uh, in, in South Africa. And uh, you know, you'll get silly quotes like sort of um, from Andrew Gettys Baines here of the his description about uh, Nicholas, and, and it comes out of this discourse in which Nicholas is seen as kind of a, a scam rather than somebody who's actually a very complex, very sophisticated, very capable uh, agent um, in the historical progression of South Africa. All right, so I'm sorry for all the text, we're going to have a break with a picture, so in case you, you don't know, and I think there's a laser pointer thing, no, that doesn't work. Um, I'm going to just stand up for you. So, the sort of time that we're talking about, this is the, the Cape Colony, yeah, this is Krakow from where Nicholas leaves. Nicholas will end up living at a place called Mazeppa Bay, right, which is close to the hole in the wall, you know, that sort of area. And um, Butterworth is the mission station, which is founded in 1827, which I told you about, that he's very much involved in, okay. And then he then helps found Morley in 1829, and he is killed, we're not exactly sure where uh, precisely, but in this sort of area over here. And it's these three rivers that we're going to look at a little bit more closely in the next section of the talk, which is about his son Hans. Uh, it's the Tsitsa, the Tina, and the Mzumbubu. The Mzumbubu goes all the way up to the Drakensberg, and they all come into the, the sea there. That section is known as the Mzumbubu as well. But the two big tributaries, the Tina and the Tsitsa, uh, and the Mzumbubu itself, are the heartland of what would become Hans Lachenberg's uh, community, which we're going to look at now. This area uh, in the late second half of the 19th century is known as no man's land, even though the colonists knew that there were many Khoisan groups living here, particularly San groups who spoke a language called Kha, you know, uh, they didn't see San as people and therefore the San didn't really matter, um, and therefore this land didn't belong to anybody which is absolute nonsense, okay? it belonged to uh, song groups. All right? This is the Corsa homeland in yellow here, next to that is Tembu, um, and then eastern and western of Ponderland, again, appear the same color, and then Zululand over there, um, and the Tal Colony. All right, so we're going to now turn to looking at uh, Hans Lachenberg um, and why he ends up being there. So one of the things that we were, were very interested in uh, in this when we first started look, investigating Hans and Nicholas. Is we know that Nicholas Lochenberg is all the way over at Batten. Why is it that Hans ends up in this area? What what made him come here? Um, and from what we can tell is that after the, the death of Nicholas, Sarah um, moves basically into the mission station with her remaining children, including Hans and Willie, or William, as he's called, and a few daughters. Um, and then she sort of disappears from uh, the record at this point. Um, except in, in, in the early 1830s, Andrew Smith, who passes through the Butterworth mission station, sees them there and he says that the, the, the children of Nicholas Lachenberg, uh, the murdered Nicholas Lachenberg, are still living here. So it's unclear how old um, Hans is at this point. Um, and then again, the, sorry, the next time we then hear of, Nick, of Hans, okay, is in 1842. It's the first account that we can find of him in the, the archival material so far. And he's acting as a uh, interpreter to uh, the missionary Horatio Pierce. Right. So Hans is still very much involved with the missionaries. 
we know that his brother Willem will become uh, what's called a catechist. That is a, a type of a lay preacher uh, who uh, the missionaries would uh, teach various scriptures to, and they would go out and then teach those scriptures to various communities. So they're very much still involved with the church and the mission stations, and they, they become intertwined in the spread of the mission stations across uh, the southeastern part of South Africa. Just to put it in context, the mission stations sort of start close to the Cape Colony and then go further and further uh, eastwards. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Hans comes to be in this area. Only one. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of other reasons again. Just something that's of interest here is that um, Pierce notes that uh, Hans uh, helps uh, Chief Sahili, who is the successor to um, uh, Chief Hinsa, uh, the paramount chief of, of the Clauses. Um, uh, in terms of he fixes a rifle that people had accused someone of bewitching. Um, so it's quite clear that he's kind of inherited from his mother's side this interest in the mission stations and the ability, to, the, the linkage to the mission stations. But also from his father's side, he's inherited some hunting skills. And uh, we'll see that uh, again soon. Okay. Sure. Um, then the next big period in which we hear about Hans, and actually this is the major area that we hear about Hans, um, I might actually skip the slides and just do this, um, is this, what's known as the Finney Investigations between 1848 and 1851. Henry Francis Finn is sent to this no man's land area in that period to find out who the Sam peoples are that are raiding cattle from the Moy River area in KwaZulu Natal. Okay. Uh, the colonial the colonists in that area have been losing cattle every second or third day. Okay. Big words of cattle coming out. It's been widely suspected that the guys who are involved are the Amabatra, um, down in the Snowman's Land area, and they're associated or friends who are uh, Sam peoples. And this is in fact true, the Sam and the Batra are involved in cattle, right? but everyone's involved in cattle. Even the Europeans are doing capital raiding. It's the economy before mine and even after. Okay? Capital raiding is just a way of life in, in this country. Um, and anyway, so Finn comes down, and Finn is a very, very smart and astute observer. He speaks Zulu fluently, He's, he knows Farku intimately, he knew Shaka. Uh, like Nicholas, this guy knows what's going on. Okay? He's connected and wired into communities. And uh, the first thing that Finn does is he appoints a number of people who act as his agents or spies. And he sends these people out into the landscape. And then he starts to interview people. All right? And he, quickly he figures out he can give them the runaround. All right? And the one name that keeps coming up again and again and again, the person who's behind all of this, Hans Lachenberg. Okay? <laughs> and you can see that Finn is beginning to get um, uh, increasingly frustrated because he can't kind of nail Lachenberg again. Okay? And uh, anyway, so uh, sorry, we're going to skip through a lot of this correspondence, but there's a, a, a massive amount of correspondence between Finn and the various missionaries at this point. Okay? The missionaries are interacting uh, or acting on behalf of the various communities there, and they are not happy with Finn. They don't like what Finn's doing and they want to thwart Finn. And the missionaries protect Hans Lachenberg. And it's largely because Willem is attached to one of these mission stations at this point and he's, he's teaching Christian lessons to people. So he's speaking up for his brother. Okay? And uh, Hans is the naughty of the two brothers, almost certainly. Um, but that's not to say that he's, he's uh, you know, a rogue as people might like to portray him. Okay. Um, and at one point, uh, Finn's frustration boils over. Right? In these days, people weren't rude in their emails. Okay? They didn't use their, their cool and swear at each other. It's very, very polite. Right? Extremely polite. So you've got to read between the lines when someone's making a barbed comment. But uh, Finn writes to the Reverend Jenkins, who's the Wesleyan missionary at, um, in the Sims movie area. And he says to him, um, I want to know if Hans Lachenberg is a member of your, your society. Okay? Um, because if he's not, I'm going to throw the, the, the book of war at him. <laughs> I'm going to go after him. But if he is, I'm obviously going to be a bit more careful. 
Jenkins, from what you can see, the, the, the date is on this letter is five months after uh, uh, Finn actually asks about this. Jenkins writes a response. So it's clear that Jenkins is trying to avoid answering the issue. Right? But it turns out he eventually has to answer the issue and he says, no, Hans is not one of our, our community members, but he um, and anyway, the, all of this, this is, uh, it's a massive interesting correspondence and so on. But all of this eventually comes to a head 